All right, this is the fourth video for the INTC 1291 Introduction to Test Equipment Course for the Fluke 744 Documenting Process Calibrator. In this video, I'm going to be showing you, um, we're going to be connecting this to provide loop power to the Rosemont 3051 Differential Pressure Transmitter. But we're really just using this to show how we hook up to do communications or use this as a communicator to be able to see what's going on within the transmitter and actually make some changes if we need to. So, just like we showed in a, a few videos ago, I want to provide loop power, so I'm going to hook up to the milliamp ports. I know loop power is not being provided because it's not at the top of the screen. Go ahead and terminate my wires, red to positive. black to negative come into setup I'm going to enable loop power done verify that the transmitter is getting power Screen came on. Now I'm going to move this to the side. So that I can bring in the cable that we need to use to connect this as, to use it as a communicator. So if I look on the side, I have my serial, the port. You can see it, it only goes in one, one it's a shape like a D and it's got nine pins. The five on top, four on bottom. Plug that in, and of course, you can kind of tighten these down by hand or use a screwdriver. Have to have a flat head here. Now, communicators, even though if you pull out uh, another communicator, which is, there's the Emerson 475 communicator, and it has a red lead and it has a black lead, but to communicate, polarity is not required, so as you see in this, they're both black wires, it doesn't matter which one I connect, I connect this one to positive, this negative, or vice versa. I'm just going to bring that back over, and show you, I'm just going to connect them on, connect this one to my positive. This one to my negative. I'm going to slide this back over. Bring this back into focus. And I'm going to just hit the heart button. Right? Heart communication. Searching for a heart device. Please wait. And it found a 3051. And it's telling me that right now the process variable is reading 1.18 inches of water. And that probably because I have it sideways. So if I lay this so that both of the pressure diaphragms are on the same plane, it gets a lot closer to zero. Okay. And uh, the analog output, I see it's at 4 milliamps. My LRV is zero inches. My URV in this case happens to be, it says 99.94, should be probably 100. There we go. You can see that a lot better. Okay. So if I go into setup while in here, I can just do basic setup. And I can go in here and change you know the tag number for this. So say I say this was pressure transmitter 101. There we go. I have to actually go into here and give the tag number. One, zero, one, and say A, right? 
enter done then I can send that to the transmitter it's going to upload it from here into the transmitter loop should be removed from automatic control continue and now it has a tag tag number of 101a right the process variable units I could change the units in here um, if I wanted to say hey I want to read in inches of water PSI bar so forth most of our instruments, especially pressure transmitters, we're going to be working with inches of water, especially for level calculations. Okay, so I'm going to leave it on inches of water. Go ahead and hit send. Continue. Now these lower range values, they don't, they don't look quite right. Someone must have went in here and punched these in, but I can set the lower range value to be exactly... 0, 0, 0.00 and I can hit the upper range value to be exactly say 100.00 0, 0. hit send continue and now it's put those two values in there now now we see a damping of five seconds now this is this is something that you're going to pay attention to in later classes this is normally not something that is something that's discussed within it with the test equipment class but I'll go ahead and talk about it now damping is five seconds you need to realize this that it's the math on this is actually based off of uh, the RC time constants or resistive capacitive time constants. So the amount of time it takes a capacitor to charge up, you know, so that, not that it's actually, this is actually based on the on capacitors, but it follows the same math. And the fact that damping slows down when there's a change in the sensor how this is going to change the output of the transmitter how the transmitter is going to change the output of the transmitter so do I want to see um, if the sensor goes from zero inches of water column to 50 inches of water column really quickly do I want to see that immediate change in the output of the transmitter well you know with with something such a large change very quickly sure but sometimes we get you know where things are kind of moving around quite a bit and we want to we want to filter that going into the house so they're not getting erratic readings jumping all over the place even though the readings may be actually jumping all over the place they don't necessarily want to see it jumping all over the place and so damping will smooth out the output of the transmitter so that say I say I get a change of 10 inches of water column it'll take five seconds before the output of the transmitter gives you 66, roughly 66 or two thirds of the value of change. Okay, so if we had a change, an actual change of 10 inches of water column, it will slowly ramp up the change on the output of the transmitter to match. It'll take five seconds for it to say that there's only been six inches of water column change. And then the next five seconds will be 66% of the remaining amount. And then the next five seconds will be 66% of that. And then, you know, so forth. So, typically, whatever the damping is set at five seconds, just multiply that by five. And that's about how long it's going to take for the output of the transmitter to catch up to the change in the sensor. Okay? So, a damping of five is actually going to take 25 seconds, which is huge, right? Um, normally, we want a low damping. And there are max and mins based on the transmitter. I'm going to try to go to zero. I don't know if it'll let me. We'll try. It actually let me put zero, zero seconds. So in the, the exact moments a change happens on the sensor, the output is going to change at the exact same ratio almost instantaneously right. transfer function this is more of a because this is a differential pressure transmitter these things can be used for a lot of things uh, to include you know pressure readings um, doing level calculations based on pressure readings and then we can also calculate flow rates when this transmitter is used in conjunction with an orifice plate restriction which causes a increase in pressure on one side of the, the plate and a drop in pressure on the other. Think of it like a you have a pipe this round, but then in the middle you have a hole and the rest of it's covered by a plate. 
if you have a larger volume of a liquid trying to squeeze into a small hole, the pressure going in is going to increase. And because all that is being pushed through a small hole and then it's allowed to expand back out, the pressure then decreases. So we get a high pressure on one side and a low pressure on the other. And we can actually measure the differential pressure across that plate and the differential pressure across that plate changes based on the flow rate. But it's not a linear calculation. It has to be done with a square root function. So I'd come in here, transfer function, say, hey, I just want to do a square root. It's got a lot of other, uh, other options. Square to the third power, square to the fifth power, special curve. Okay? A lot of times we're just going to go, if we use it, square root or linear. Right? I'm going to hit done. Now, that was just basic setup. I can go in here and do sensor setup. And it's telling me what the sensor limits are. Right? So this transmitter, the limitations on its, sens on its diaphragm sensing elements is negative 250 inches water column up to 250 positive. Right? So a span of 500. But the minimum span is 1. So what, that, what, that, what that's telling me is, is I can set a URV and an LRV. They have to be at least one inch, inches of water column apart. I can't say, hey, I want my LRV to be zero and my URV to be 0. 0.5. It might actually let me do it, but minimum sensor span. This is kind of direct tied to its accuracy. Like if you're trying to have a span less than one, then chances are you're not going to get that accurate of a number. You want to go with a different model. Yep. Back out of this. Uh, device identification, heart output. Okay. This is where I can set the alarm state. Heart pole address, which you'll learn in other classes. Uh, if it's a heart device, just a standalone it has its own loop power, connects to the DCS on itself. The address is always going to be zero. If you give this device any address other than zero, then the device automatically thinks it's like in a multi-drop situation. And that will mess things up with you if you're trying to treat it, if it's actually hooked up as a standalone instrument loop, because it's going to park its milliamps at four milliamps and never change the output. Um, so if you, if you notice as you have a transmitter that's just stuck at 4 milliamps all the time, you might want to go check to make sure that its polling address has been, you know, has not been changed from zero. It won't actually let me change my alarm state from here. So maybe that's something I cannot do with the, the fluke. It'll at least show it to me. I know if I had a... Um, 475, I can actually probably change the alarm state of this and or come in here and open up the, you know, take the LCD display off and there might be a dip switch in there for me to change the alarm. And of course, heart information. Not much I can do here. It's just telling me, hey, it's a Rosemont hardware revision device ID, right? Very simple um, communication functions, but a lot of times that's all you really need. I need to go in there, hey, I need to, you know, range it. Um, I need to set my range values, my URV, my LRV. I need to see, you, you, you can do some basic calibration with it, right? Um, if I actually had pressure hooked up to this, I could come in here and do sensor. Um, again, there's nothing I can do in here, right? Basic. It's not gonna. It's not gonna let me calibrate the the, the the sensor. With an actual communicator, I could hook up to this device and I could zero the the transmitter. So, like right now, process variable. I'm gonna hit done. I'm gonna hit abort. I'm gonna come out here and see. It says process variable is 0 0.08. That's not that far off, but that's not zero. It should be zero because the high side and the low side are both referencing the same pressure so the differential pressure it's reading should be zero that's something i would want to do a, a zero trim on 
and I don't think it's going to, oh, maybe under service. Here we go. Yeah, service. I can do a loop test. Pressure zero trim. All right, here we go. Pressure zero trim. Loop should be. Okay. So this will let me do my calibration of, of my pressure sensor. All right, so now that 0 .08, 0 0.09 should go to reading zero. I'm gonna hit abort. Now I've got zero. Right? It's probably just under zero, which is why it's giving me 3.9998, and it's going just above. And that might just be because of just you know the air conditioning, air blowing past this. If I, if I wave my hand and yeah, let's go back into that service. And uh, we can do a loop test. Continue. Now, I have no reason to do a loop test right now. This is this is my power supply hooked up, providing this to this. I could hook up to these terminals across the negative and the test terminal and plug that in to measure milliamps, but I can't provide loop power I cannot source milliamps and measure milliamps at the same time with this. So I would need a, a separate reference meter. But I could use this to, uh, as a communicator, if this had loop power hooked up from a DCS, the DCS was the, the I.O. card and all that power supply, I could use this as a communicator to come into here, and this will tell this, I don't care what you see on your sensor, just put out 4 milliamps. This isn't producing the milliamps, so this is telling this to put out what you be it believes is 4 milliamps. And then I can actually measure the milliamps on the output and see, hey, is it actually there, and perform a uh, output trim, or, or what we might call a D to A trim, or analog output trim, or digital to analog output trim. Okay. And of course you see your standard, you know, we got 0, which is actually 4 milliamps, 50%, 12 milliamps, 20 milliamps. 100%, or I can type in the exact value if I want 16, which is seven, you know, 17% or 75%. Sorry. And this thing would try to manipulate the current on the loop to be 16 milliamps. Right? And it's saying the process analog output is 16. I'm gonna hit done. Exiting loop test. Press any key. And of course, output trim, where I was telling you we could perform output trim. But it says connect a milliamp measure to a device, right? So I'm providing this loop power from this, so it's telling me, hey, you got to hook up another measuring device to measure your current to actually perform this uh, output trim, right? I'm going to hit abort on this. Abort. Come back out. So we went into the service we had set set up. Let's go into the process. And it's just giving me readings, which was kind of like what the display on this thing was telling me. It says negative 1.26. This is yeah, it's reading about the same. Percent of range. So this is below. The same below zero inches of water column. That's because I raised it up. Next page. Yeah, so that's, that's your standard walkthrough of how to use this as a communicator with a demonstration with the 30, Rosemont 3051 differential pressure transmitter. Again, if you, have, if you have any questions off of any of the videos for this Fluke 744, uh, if you're a student in my class, please send, a, send me an email, let me know, or leave a comment below.